Morning, church. Uh, let me get ready here. You can take your Bible out. Uh, we'll be jumping through a few different verses today. Um, but camping in one spot mostly. Thank you, Terrence, for worship. And yeah, that, that last song is always really powerful for me. Just the idea that Christ will hold on to us and won't let us go. Such a reassuring um, fact. And yeah, we're just so thankful for that. Um, let's pray before we begin. Father, uh, thank you, God, for this morning. Uh, thank you for the weather being nice and cool. And um, yeah, just to have a, a time of worship. Uh, we can come before you, God, as the church body and lift up your name. Uh, pray, Lord, for this morning as we go through your word, Lord, that may you speak to us, God, and may you show us the truth of uh, what you have to say. I pray, God, that um, the words that come out of my mouth, God, would be pleasing and uh, glorifying to you. And so we thank you, God, for this morning, and we pray all these things in your name. Amen. I don't know if you guys have heard, but there uh, just a few weeks ago, a new French movie came out on Netflix. Um, it sounded promising and illuminating in a way. Uh, the director herself, this is her own words. This is what she said the reason was for why she made this movie. Uh, she, she said, and I quote, I wanted to open people's eyes to what's truly happening in schools and on social media, forcing them to confront images of young girls who are made up, dressed up, dancing suggestively to imitate their favorite pop icon. I wanted adults to spend 96 minutes seeing the world through the eyes and the lens of an 11-year-old girl as she lives 24 hours a day. I think most of us can agree that social media is a huge issue for not only our youth today, for, but for even for us. Um, you know, social media addiction is a very real thing, and just the, the different ways that we're influenced by it is a very real thing. And so the director of this movie is right. Uh, I'm not an 11-year-old girl, uh, so I don't know what it's like to live as an 11-year-old girl, especially in this time when they have access to all sorts of social media and pressures that, you know, I never had to face. Um, in this selfie age, we are bombarded with images and, and, and social pressures and uh, that, you know, yeah, we just, we just don't have to deal with it right now uh, as adults. Uh, and as adults, we still have to face it right now. But imagine being, you know, 11 year old girl and, and having that influence your mind basically almost 24 seven. You know, I have some maturity under my belt but these girls just what 11 year old 12 year old 13 year old they don't have that kind of experience and so i, I think i got facebook in, in the last year of my high school years and even then you know it wasn't this immediate uh like snapchat tiktok instagram kind of gratification or pressure that they face now so these girls and these boys even, uh, they see their friends, you know, they post selfies. They see celebrities that they admire looking a certain way, acting a certain way. They see people and other friends or call or uh, 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 other students uh, getting liked more than they are. Um, and so this director, she made this movie. And again, I'm quoting again, to start a debate about the sexualization of children in society today so that maybe, just maybe, politicians, artists, parents, and educators could work together to make a change that will benefit children for generations to come. And this is a fantastic idea. You know, we, we certainly need to have these conversations. We need to understand how to better protect our children from this corrupt and sex-saturated world that we live in. Um, this director, I believe, had very good intentions. She had really good intentions. But, and there's a but here, there's a problem. And the problem is that these good intentions that she had, they were executed really terribly, really miserably, really horribly. See, the, these good intentions weren't back with the, the right actions. Uh, once the movie was released and people watched it, and disclaimer, I, I did not watch it, but I read trusted articles that talked about it. Um, 
But what many people saw was simply a movie that actually sexually exploited children. These very young actresses were shown to be doing things that we would all agree is not appropriate for these girls to do, and especially not on the big screen for everyone to see. So essentially, this director, she committed the exact crime that she wanted to help solve. Um, her good intentions were not followed by the right actions. And yes, you know, her movie may have brought up and show, shown light on the issue of, you know, sexualization of children, but that doesn't justify how she did it. And so oft, how often is this the case in our lives where we supposedly have good intentions, but we don't follow those intentions with proper practice? You know, like, like when a couple gets married, you know, they, they share wedding vows that certainly have good intentions for the marriage. No one goes into a marriage or most likely no one goes into a marriage hoping to get divorced. Uh, but those need to be followed with continual acts of love and care. Otherwise, divorce may happen. At Lighthouse, when you become a member, you make a commitment to the church. You have every intention to be obedient to the Lighthouse Covenant. But we know there are cases when a member stops honoring that commitment, breaks the covenant, and then that good intention that they had, it just falls by the wayside. So what does God think about our good intentions? Do those good intentions justify the means? And, and what should we do with these good intentions? This morning we're gonna uh, we're gonna read about we're gonna read about a few people in the Bible who seem to have good intentions, but like the director of that French movie, they don't fall through with godly actions. They are thinking godly thoughts, but ultimately they don't obey God's instructions. And then we'll see what happens when those good intentions are actually paired with appropriate action and godly action. And finally, we'll see that we should obey God's instructions unashamedly for God's glory. So turn with me to 2 Samuel chapter 6. If you remember, uh, actually the last time I preached a couple months ago, we were in 1 Samuel 13. Uh, we'll be in 2 Samuel 6 today. And uh, the last time I talked, uh, last time I preached, uh, we talked about King Saul. And he was the first king of Israel. We saw, how, we saw how Saul let his circumstances dictate how much he was obedient to God. Um, eventually, he doesn't obey God fully, and he doesn't repent of his sins either. But right now, we're in 2 Samuel, and, and now Saul, is, he's dead already. Uh, his error is over. In fact, all of his sons have either died or been murdered. Uh, and then now, it, it's, it's David's turn. Uh, you know, after fleeing from Saul's wrath for so many years, it's finally David's time to shine. We'll see uh, in the beginning of 2 Samuel, uh, in 2 Samuel 2, uh, you'll see that David is anointed king of Judah. And then in chapter 5, he's the king of Israel. Um, and throughout these first five chapters, or even his whole life, he's been doing all the right things, right? Um, we we'll see in 2 Samuel that when he hears about Saul's death, uh, this guy who has been, you know, chasing him and trying to kill him, he does the right thing in the sense that he, he mourns for Saul and Jonathan, uh, because he recognizes that Saul was God's anointed. And then later on in chapter 5, when the Philistines come to attack David, he inquires of the Lord. He asks God for advice and for wisdom and what he should do. And then he goes on and defeats the Philistines. And we see in 2 Samuel that it says, everything that the king did pleased all the people. And also that David became greater and greater for the Lord, the God of hosts, was with him. And so just as everything was going great for Saul when he first became king, things are going so well for David at this point in the, in the, in the narrative. And, but eventually something not so great happens uh, for both of them. For Saul, something not so great happens. And then for David, something not so great happens. And, and while Saul was kind of an anti-model for us and someone that we should kind of learn what not to do, this morning we're going to learn from David. And that learn that we should follow him and follow what he did. And so let's uh, read our passage. I'm, I'm just going to read the whole, the whole chapter, actually. Um, so just bear with me. Uh, but hopefully it'll, uh, we'll get a good idea of what we're going to talk about today. Second uh, Samuel chapter 6. David again gathered all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000. And David arose and went with the people who were with him to Baal Judah to bring up from there the ark of God. 
which is called by the name of the Lord of hosts, who sits enthroned on the cherubim. And they carried the ark of God on a new cart and brought it out of the house of Abinadab, who was, which was on the hill. And Uzzah and Ahio, the sons of Abinadab, were driving the new cart with the ark of God, and Ahio went before the ark. And David and all the house of Israel were making merry before the Lord with songs and lyres and harps and tambourines and castanets and cymbals. And when they came to the threshing floor of Nacon, Uzzah put out his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen stumbled. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and God struck him down there because of his error, and he died there beside the ark of God. And David was angry because the Lord had burst forth against Uzzah. And that place is called Perez Uzzah to, his, to this day. And David was afraid of the Lord that day. And he said, how can the ark of the Lord come to me? So David was not willing to take the ark of the Lord into the city of David. But David took it aside to the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. And the ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite, three months. And the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and all his household. And it was told King David, the Lord has blessed the household of Obed-Edom and all that belongs to him because of the ark of God. So David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with rejoicing. And when those who bore the ark of the Lord had gone six steps, he sacrificed an ox and a fattened animal. And David danced before the Lord with all his might. And David was wearing a linen ephod. So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of the horn. As the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, Michal, the, da the daughter of, Sa of Saul, looked out of the window and saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, and she despised him in her heart. And they brought in the ark of the Lord and set it in its place inside the tent that David had pitched for it. And David offered burnt, off burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. And when David had finished offering the burnt offerings and the peace offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord of hosts and distributed it among all the people, the whole multitude of Israel, both men and women, a cake of bread, a portion of meat, and a cake of raisins to each one. Then all the people departed, each to his house. And David returned to bless his household. But Michal, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David and said, how the king of Israel honored himself today, uncovering himself today before the eyes of his servants, female servants, as one of the vulgar fellows shamelessly uncovers himself. And David said to Michal, it was before the Lord who chose me above your father and above all his house to appoint me as prince over Israel, the people of the Lord, and I will make merry before the Lord. I will make myself yet more contemptible than this, and I will be abased in your eyes. But by the female servants of whom you have spoken, by them I shall be held in honor. And Michal, the daughter of Saul, had no child to the day of her death. So to begin with, what David does uh, to begin this passage is, is a very big deal. Um, you know, it's interesting. He's just been, uh, in a, not, or he's, been he's just been uh, named king of Israel, king of Judah. But we don't see any celebration or any coronation of his kingship. Uh, the, no, the first thing that David wants to do is bring the Ark of God into Jerusalem. And that's a big deal. The Ark, you know, it was built back in the days of Moses and it represented the throne of God. Uh, but it's been over 20 years since this Ark has been with God's people. David, he wants to protect the Ark from his enemies uh, since it was such an important symbol for Israel. And David wants to make Jerusalem into not just his political capital for his kingdom and for his dynasty, but also the spiritual capital of all Israel. He wants all Israel to come and worship God. So he no doubt wants it to be known that God is central in everything that he does, central in all of Israel, and that God is the true ruler of his kingdom. And so in wanting to bring the ark into Jerusalem, David has the right intentions. He wants to glorify God in doing this, but then, as we read, it initially goes terribly wrong. And his good intentions simply aren't good enough on their own. And so let's first look actually at, at poor Uzzah. Uh, and, and this story of Uzzah it, it is a difficult passage. You know, if uh, you know, a non-Christian or non-believer were to come to you and kind of try and challenge you, he might say, man, this story about Uzzah, like, how could God do this to him? How could he allowed Uzzah to die just by, you know, reaching out, trying to, you know, protect the, the ark. How could, how could this be? 
And at first glance, it doesn't seem like Uzzah really did anything wrong, right? I mean, verse 6, if you look at it, it says that the oxen stumbled, and then Uzzah, he put out his hand to the ark of God to, to take hold of it. So it really sounds like the ark of God was going to hit the ground, you know? Uh, it really seems that Uzzah just instinctively just reached out to save the ark from falling. It's like that, you know, instinctive reaction that we might have when something drops from like a table or from a ledge. Uh, it's an instinctive reaction. Like I have an ergonomic mouse next to my laptop. Uh, it's, you know, it's a little bit taller than a normal mouse. So a lot of times when I'm typing and I move over to my mouse, I'll just like knock it over. And it, I don't have a mouse pad, so it doesn't stick there. And so it just slides off my desk. And my instinct is just try to reach under and try to grab it before it falls down and makes this huge no- noise. Um, I don't think about what it ha- what what I'm doing. I, it just, it just happens. Right. And so as a, it, it seems like that's what it's the same thing that he's doing. But of course this situation is a little different, right? Because while I'm knocking down this, like, you know, this, this mouse that means has no meaning. We're talking about the Ark of God here and a little bit more background that Uzza, he's a Levite. Okay. And Levite is the family that is in charge of the Levites are the family that are in charge of taking care of the Ark of God. His father was Abinadab, as we see in, in the first few verses. And Abinadab was put in charge of this ark in Second Samuel. Uh, wait, uh, in, in, in First Samuel, he was put in charge of the ark. Um, and so Uzzah and his family, he knew very well how the ark should be handled. They had it for a long time. And if we look at Numbers 4.15, turn with me there. Uh, it's, it's a very relevant passage to what we're talking about here. Numbers 4.15. And keep your, keep your uh, bookmark, your hand in, in the current passage. Numbers 4.15. Um, we see that in, in Numbers 4.15, sorry. So we see that when Aaron and his sons have finished covering the sanctuary and all the furnishings of the sanctuary, as the camp sets out, after that, the sons of Kohath shall come and carry these, but they must not touch the holy things lest they die. These are the things of the tent of meeting that sons of Kohath are to carry. And so it says that the sons of Kohath, they must not touch the holy things lest they die. It's written in scripture. So, uh, and Uzzah knows this very well because Uzzah's family is very likely from the line of Kohath. Otherwise, they wouldn't even have had the ark to begin with because only the sons of Kohath are allowed to, to handle it. And so Uzzah knew that he could not touch the ark because God had deemed it so. That was God's instructions. The ark of God represented God's holiness and nothing unclean could ever touch it and live. And R.C. Sproul explains this scene in this way. He says, Uzzah believed that the mud of the ground would desecrate the ark. But mud is just dirt and water. It's obeying God all the time. Mud is not evil. God's law was not meant to keep the ark pure from the earth, but from the dirty touch of a human hand. Uzzah presumed his hands were cleaner than the dirt, and God said no. And for that split second, Uzzah seemed to think he could save God from being unclean. He may have thought he had good intentions, but his actions were actually not godly. His instincts failed him in the same way that, you know, our instincts might fail us when, say, we stub our toe or, you know, a door slams on our fingers and we let out like a profanity, a word that we shouldn't normally be saying. Uzzah's mind should have been so trained to not consider even touching the God's Ark as our mind should be so trained to not let unwholesome speech out of our mouths. You know, we ought to tame our tongue, not have foul mouths, even if it comes out by instinct. May we be so trained to glorify God that we glorify God by instinct. And so Uzzah, although he had in his mind good intentions, his actions weren't actually godly. His actions were opposed to what God said to do. Uzzah, though, here is it's just a minor character. David is the main character here. And really part of the blame for Uzzah's death falls on David as well. David is the king. He makes the decisions. And even though David also has good intentions in bringing the ark into Jerusalem, he didn't fully consider the proper way to do that. 
Unlike in his battle with the Philistines, David inquired of the Lord there. He, he asked God what he should be doing. Here, we don't see him inquiring of the Lord at all. And perhaps if he did, he would have been reminded of Exodus 25, of number seven, where God spoke through Moses that the ark must be carried with poles by the sons of Kohath. Exodus 25, he describes how there were two gold poles that were inserted into the, the rings on the sides of the ark. And number seven then says that the sons of Kohath were charged with the service of the holy things that had to be carried on the shoulder, not on this cart. But David instead instructs that the ark be taken to Jerusalem on this cart. And in this, and this is the, the way that he brings he tries to bring uh, the ark into Jerusalem is the same way that the Philistines actually transported the ark as well. The Philistines knew no, no, knew no better, right? They just were trying to get rid of the ark because the ark had just crushed their foreign god and anyone who looked upon the ark for the Philistines immediately died. And so David should have known not to follow the Philistines' lead. He should have known what was the, pro- the proper way to transport the ark. He wanted to worship God, but John MacArthur, he puts it well, and he says, God doesn't want your worship unless it goes along with his word. God doesn't want your worship unless it goes along with his word. And ultimately, what David did doesn't go along with God's word. And then it results in Uzzah's death. And how does David immediately react to Uzzah's death? Uh, We see here in... Verses, in verses eight, uh, verses, yeah, in verses eight, in verse eight, it says David was angry because the Lord had burst forth against Uzzah. And then later in verse nine, it says David was afraid of the Lord that day. So he feels two emotions. He feels anger and he feels fear. But what is he actually angry about? And, and who is he angry at? Part of his anger may have been towards Uzzah for touching the ark, for dying, for making this big scene. Because in his mind, he had this great, like, grand procession, uh, this great celebration that was supposed to be glorious and awesome. But then that completely got ruined because this guy died. And for the first time, it also seems that David is angry at God. You know, up to this point, he has done no wrong. Um, And he's always felt protected and he's always felt blessed by God. And perhaps David has gotten a little complacent in his view of God, such that there isn't as much of this fear of God as there once was. We, he, we know that David was a man after God's own heart, literally a man like God's heart. But for the first time, he has done wrong by trying to bring the ark in his own way without consulting God rather than in God's way. For the first time, he doesn't respect God's holiness as he should. You know, earlier I mentioned uh, the, the love and care a husband and wife should show one another continually in marriage because of their vows and just because of marriage. Um, and, I, and although I try to do that with Allie, uh, there are certainly times when I get complacent in really listening to her, uh, especially if it's something that she repeats to me over and over as a reminder. Um, and, I, and, and she repeats to me so many times, that I feel like I've already got it down. And that, uh, and I've heard it so many times already, it, 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 it's settled, it, it's done, I, I got it. For instance, uh, when we leave our house together, um, we often lock the door from the inside. It's one of those locks where, you know, it's not a bolt lock. It's a, just a normal lock. And almost every time before uh, I close the door, before we actually leave, Allie will ask, uh, do you have the keys? And I, you know, I'll show her the keys or I'll impatiently say, yes, I have the keys. They're right here. And in my mind, I think I already have this issue completely figured out, that we're never going to have a problem, that I'll always have the keys with me. And I don't need Allie to remind me anymore. But I think you can see where this is going. (laughs) There was one Sunday, uh, we needed to get to church early for a prayer meeting. And we were kind of in a rush. Uh, We were both, and we both went out of the house. And then I closed the door shut. Just as Allie was about to ask, do you have the keys? But she had a piece of bread in her mouth, so she couldn't get the words out. (laughs) And then, so the, the door is shut, and I remember thinking in, like, the recess, the back of my mind, you know, as I was closing the door, I, I remember thinking, she's going to ask that, and I should think about it, but my hand closed the door faster than my mind could process that. 
And just like that, we were locked out. And just like that, we were down $125. <laughs> that split decision, split, split second decision to, to wait and to think more clearly could have saved us not only the $125, it could allow us to get to church early, it could allow us to make the prayer meeting. I was obviously angry at myself, you know, for not being patient, not thinking things through, not thinking this plan through. And I wonder if David also was angry at himself for not thinking his plan through. And the lesson that was taught to me that day was to not take Ali's wise words of warning for granted anymore. You know, I need to think things through to make sure I have the proper, take the proper precautions. You know, even when I think I know it all, I think I know everything is set and, you know, I'm not going to make any mistakes. Unfortunately, it actually happened again, but that's a story for another time. <laughs> um, but likewise, for David, you know, he knew God very well already, right? He had heard about God's holiness when the Philistines were struck down and he highly revealed, revered Saul who God anointed. He now, and now he witnessed firsthand in our story here just how reverent he ought to be towards God's holiness how he should view God and his instructions. One commentator shares, when people are no longer awed, respectful, or fearful of God's holiness, the community is put at risk. If we're not awed, respectful, and fearful of God's holiness, we're all put at risk. This fear that David felt in verse 9 was a genuine godly fear. And in asking that question, how can the ark of the Lord come to me? He was so afraid of incurring more consequences of God's holiness. He was awestruck. He was dumbfounded at a loss for words and actions. He felt unworthy to finish the good intentions he started out with. And so he leaves the ark with Obed-Edom. So David, he suffered a setback, a failure, just like Saul did when he didn't wait for Samuel to offer the burnt offerings. Like Saul, this error was the very first real uh, error that David made. And, but David doesn't follow in Saul's footsteps, right? You know, Saul didn't repent. He didn't correct his sinful actions. In contrast, we do see David make the changes necessary to truly honor the Lord. Upon hearing that God has blessed the house of Obed-Edom because the ark was there, David feels ready to bring uh, the ark into Jerusalem again. And this time he, this time he makes three important changes. First, in verse 13, we see that uh, at the end, or at the beginning, it says, when those who bore the ark of the Lord had gone six steps. So they bore the ark of the Lord this time. And, and if this isn't enough clarification, the, the parallel passage in First Chronicles 15 tells of the story as well. And it says, the Levites carried the ark of God upon their shoulder with the poles, which is exactly the way that Numbers, or the Exodus 25 and number 7 says that they should do. So that's the first thing. And second, on top of changing how the ark was transported, we also see that David exchanged his royal robes of a king for the linen ephod worn by priests, a very simple white loincloth. Third, not only that, David also instructs the people to offer sacrifices right at the beginning and at the end of the journey. He himself sacrificed an ox and a fattened animal after they had gone six steps. So these three changes show us that David, he earnestly wanted to do things right. The first time, he initially had good intentions, right? But now the second time, he was actually following it up with the right godly actions. And he doesn't do it while grumbling. He doesn't do it like a child pouting or just like being forced to do something, forced to clean their room or anything like that. We see that in his first attempt, he was... And in verse 5, he was making merry before the Lord. We see that uh, with songs and lyres and harps and tambourines and castings and cymbals, there's great rejoicing. And the second time, he's still rejoicing. And in verse 12, it says, they brought up the ark to the city of David with rejoicing. And then verse 16, even after a long journey, David is still leaping and dancing before the Lord. He offers burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. He blesses the people in the name of the Lord. He distributes food to all of Israel. It's this extravagant celebration, just as extravagant as the first, if not more. And because the ark of the Lord is coming to Jerusalem, God's presence is finally going to be with his people. He's going to dwell with his people again. David truly wants to honor the Lord, and he does that in the way that God prescribed. 
So let's ask ourselves, uh, are there things that we're doing right now that, you know, although the end goal is good, we're not following God, we're not honoring God with all our heart, all our worship. Uh, like I've said before, I, I've been in seminary for almost seven years now. And so I've met and interacted with a bunch of different people, a different, bunch of different seminarians. You know, everyone in seminary has their own story and the reasons that they're there, um, you know, why they're getting a degree. But by and large, you know, they all kind of have the same idea. They want to grow in their knowledge of the Lord. They want to be equipped for training and ministry. Uh, they want to go on and serve God more effectively. And I can't speak for everyone, but I believe that's the general intention of a, a, a general seminary student. And these are good intentions, right? It's good to want to serve the Lord better. It's good to want to, to, to live your life more for God. Unfortunately, I think uh, some students, they, they get overwhelmed with uh, the schoolwork or even schoolwork on top of secular work or ministry job. And they, they feel like they just need to pass the class in order to get the degree. And it doesn't matter how they get it. So right now, I'm actually, a, I'm a TA for a Hebrew professor. And, and sadly, it's clear that some students will take shortcuts on their homework uh, by just copying the answers from my answer key. Um, or, you know, they have to translate from Hebrew to English uh, a verse. And they'll just find the verse in the English Bible and just write it down. And they won't even try and attempt the, the effort it takes to try to translate themselves. And it may not be caught, you know, all the time. But, uh, but doesn't God know what they're doing? Doesn't God desire for these students to not just get the degree, but to do it in the right way as well, to do it honorably, morally, blamelessly? And if we do catch someone in this way, the, the professor that my professor will, he'll have a serious talk with the student about, you know, why he cheated, you know, and try to remind him like, this is not the way to do it. And how is this gonna, how is this gonna affect your future ministry? How, is, how are people gonna see you if they knew that this happened? And, and they try, he tries to, you know, you know, kind of realign them and try to remind them of why they were here in seminary, why they wanted to be in seminary, why they wanted to do full-time ministry. Hopefully the student will recognize, you know, where he went wrong. He'll admit his sin, he'll, he'll repent of it, and then he'll recapture that motive that he had for going to seminary. And he'll want to do things the right way again, even if, it, if it's hard to do, even if he gets a, a C or D or whatever, even if he fails a class, but he has to take it over again. I'm sure uh, you all have different things that you initially start with good intentions. Like you join a ministry team at church with the good intention of serving God, serving the church. But after a while of serving, after week to week, it's the same thing over and over again. It just becomes a chore and no longer a joy to serve. Your heart is no longer focused on God, but on just getting the job done. Uh, ugh, do I have to carry those chairs again? Ugh, I have to record another church event. Ugh, I have to lead another life on life group. We always need to be constantly reminding ourselves of these original purposes, the original intentions that we had when we decided to serve God and to edify the church. And we need to recognize the right way to go about doing that, to be constantly in prayer, to check our hearts before anything we, that we do. So going back to our passage, David has now succeeded in bringing the ark into Jerusalem. The whole city is rejoicing and celebrating the presence of God in the city of David, but one person isn't celebrating and isn't rejoicing. Verse 16, it says that Michal, David's first wife, saw David leaping and dancing with all his heart and not only was, he not rejoice, was she not rejoicing with everyone else, it says that she despised him in her heart. And this word despised is the same word that's used in Numbers 15, 31, where it talks about someone despising the word of the Lord. And this person is defiant against God. And God will completely cut this person off and that person's sin will remain on him. And then in the story of Jacob and Esau, Esau despised his birthright. He didn't care about it any longer. He thought his birthright was worth less than a bowl of stew. And many of the uses of this word, it basically means what, that whatever is despised no longer has any worth or value in the person's eyes. So in Numbers 15, the sinner sees no value in the word of the Lord. With Jacob and Esau, Esau saw no value in his birthright. And then Michal now sees no value in David. 
It's a, it was as if David was a, a piece of trash, you know, and Michal didn't want to be associated with him any longer. And, and this is the kind of reaction that, that Allie might get when she sees like a silverfish in the bathroom. Uh, you know, first she'll, she'll scream, but then after I kill it, she's disgusted by it. You know, I'll try to show it to her and she's like, ah! and she wants absolutely nothing to do with it. But there must be a reason why McCall has this strong of a reaction to David, right? I mean, he, she is his wife. Like, what's going on here? And so we hear, we see in verse 20, 28, uh, sorry, not 20, uh, verse 20, Let's read verse 20 in the way that she probably said it, in this sarcastic condemnation. She says, Oh, how the king of Israel of honored himself today, uncovering himself today before the eyes of the servants, female servants, as one of the vulgar fellows shamelessly uncovers himself. Clearly, Michal is not happy with David. And he, she even calls him this vulgar, worthless fellow. He's basically equating him with someone who's uh, immoral and scandalous. If we remember back in, in 1 Samuel, we remember the story of Michal. Michal was Saul's daughter, was King Saul's daughter. And when Michal saw David, she loved him. David, you know, had to actually kill 200 Philistines for the privilege of actually marrying Michal. And this is the David that Michal fell in love with initially. This mighty warrior, this Philistine slayer. Since then, a lot has happened. You know, she has had to help David escape from Saul's wrath. He has, she has actually become another man's wife for a period of time and then eventually was returned to David. So a lot has happened from this initial love. But still, what truly disgusted McCall in this moment was that she felt that David dishonored himself and his kingship by dancing in his priestly linen ephod. And, and he, she says that he exposed himself. And I, I want to clear that up a little bit because, you know, some may... Imagine like the image of like a streaker running at a sports event, like completely naked and just running around. And, and that's not the case at all. Okay, I assure you this was not the case because the linen ephod was this very standard garment that all priests wore. Okay, it went all the way down to their, their, their ankles. Uh, it was very plain or yeah, it was, it was, the linen part was very plain, just white, white shirt, uh, white garment. And, and possibly the garments may expose his arms and possibly part of his legs, but it wasn't like he was, you know, like, like flashing anybody, okay? Um, it wasn't like David was being indecent or scandalous at all. So Michal was really just angry about David's image and then the image that that would represent as a king. She thought David must always be distinguished and wear, wear royal clothing and doing royal things. She had this idea of what a king should look like and how he should act and it wasn't what David was doing. David responds. And in his response to Michal, we also see our last point, And that is the attitude we should have when worshiping God. That we should worship God unashamedly. David starts off in verse 20, 21. He said, it was before the Lord. And that means his, his worship was before the Lord. And again, he says, I will make merry before the Lord. You know, David doesn't care who else is there. He's worshiping to an audience of one. He's worshiping before the Lord. And I get the sense that if he were locked up in a room by himself, he would still be worshiping in the same way. He'd still be singing and dancing merrily in the exact same way because that's all he cared about in that moment. You know, so David immediately, he points out Michal's error that she didn't care about how God was honored. She cared about her own glory and, or, or David's own glory even. And it shows kind of how similar she is to her father, Saul. David, in his life, he wants to give glory to God. And in verse 22, he says, I will make myself yet more contemptible than this, and I will be abased in your eyes. The actual literal Hebrew translation is say that, says that I will be low in my own eyes, not your eyes, but my own eyes. So David will be low and he'll be of little value. He'll consider himself of low standing, little value in his own eyes. Essentially, David was, he's more concerned with honoring the Lord than his own reputation. He doesn't care about his own glory in this moment. Have you guys had those moments when you really were just giving God your all and all you could think about was giving God the glory? When it feels like there's nothing else in your mind but God and God alone. I think 
I mean, generally, I'm always thinking about myself and what can be better for me. But then in the past, there have been these moments of worship when God reminds me that it's all about him, you know, that, that Jesus died on the cross to save me from my sins and save the world from their sins to redeem us. And I can't just help but give God all the glory. It's as if I'm wa- just watching myself in third person worshiping God and I don't have any control over my body or my actions and what I do anymore because I'm just, we're just consumed by the idea that God is glorious and there's nothing else that matters in that moment. I don't care what's going around around me. I don't care about how I look. It's all about God. And that's how it seems David was worshiping God as well. He was worshiping unashamedly with all his heart and soul and mind and body. And we ought to strive to worship God in the same way, knowing that no matter what people say or think, God being honored is the only thing that matters. God being honored is the only thing that matters. Michal's opposition of David, of God's anointed, of the man like God's own heart, it signaled the end of Saul's house as part of the royal dynasty. In opposing David, she was essentially opposing God. She would have no children with David from here on out. And so again, we see this contrast between Saul and David. Saul, David, both had good intentions at the beginning of their reigns as king of Israel. Saul wanted to defeat the Philistines and protect Israel. David, he wanted to bring the Ark of God into Jerusalem. But both of them suffered setbacks due to not following God's instructions. Saul, you know, offered burnt offerings when he shouldn't have. David didn't have the Levites carry the Ark of God the way that God instructed. But David, he corrected himself. And his heart was always set on worshiping God. And this became the pattern of his life whenever he failed God. He did sin, obviously. But he always repented and turned back to God. And in the end, God does something wonderful for David and and really wonderful for all of us. You look with me uh, in the next chapter in seven, verse chapter seven, verse twelve. And here we see the the covenant, the Davidic covenant, and God's covenant with David. And it says, and I'll read from starting from verse twelve: When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you, who shall come from your body. I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. When he commits iniquity, I will discipline him with the rod of men, with the stripes of the sons of men. But my steadfast love will not depart from him, as I took it from Saul, whom I put away from you. And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. This covenant is fulfilled partially by Solomon, uh, David's son that becomes king, does establish his kingdom further. Um, But ultimately, fully, it will be be fulfilled by Jesus, by him coming on the cross, die for us, for his kingdom to reign forever, not only um, in the new heavens and the new earth. Jesus is the one that we can look to uh, for our salvation, for 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 just the fulfillment of all that God has planned for us. And so for us, you know, it's not hard to have good intentions. We intend to be good Christians. We tend to be good employees at our workplace. We intend to be good students at school. We intend to be good parents to our children. But good intentions simply aren't good enough. We must follow up those good intentions with godly actions. We have to consult God in prayer and in his word to understand how he wants us to fulfill these good intentions. And then those, when we start doing it the right way, when we start doing it with godly actions, those will result in glorifying God. We will then be encouraged to glorify God with all our heart unashamedly. So, we may, so may we not just think godly, think, not, we not just think good intentions, but may we actually act godly. May we not just think godly, but let's act godly. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, God, for your word, um, the power that it brings, God. We thank you, God, for your son that has died on the cross for our sins, um, that we are so unworthy, God, that so many times we fall, so many times we um, just don't understand and don't know, uh, take the effort, God, to really know who you are, uh, to know what you want us to do, God, to know what it means to follow you. 
And I pray, God, um, that each and every day, God, we would continue to yearn to know you more, yearn to be more obedient to you, God, yearn to give you glory more and more. I pray, Father, for our hearts, God, not just to think about the ends, Lord, think about the uh, the end goal, God, but think about how we ought to act the whole way through, God, that we act humbly, God, that we act with love, we act with care, um, we act with acknowledging who you are, um, and that everything is done um, for you, God. And so we thank you, God, for this morning. Um, may you bless the rest of uh, service and uh, the rest of our days. And we pray all these things in your name. Amen.